Good morning. Welcome to Thursday morning's early morning intuitive guidance. That's hard to say five times real fast. Showing you my cup again. I'm Dr. Bonnie Nussbaum here with some words of wisdom to start our day. And I'm going to wait a minute or two till people start to pop on. And then I'm going to frame up what I'm going to read to you so that, uh, and I'm going to withhold some information. Good morning, Abigail. Glad you are here. You're the first one popping on. I am going to withhold information from you today. And the reason I am going to do that, good morning, Joe Neal. Welcome, welcome. I am withholding information from you today to make a point, to make a point. Good morning, Gwen. Glad you are here. Welcome. So we're going to give it a minute. We're going to let people pop on and then we're going to, hopefully I've piqued your curiosity by telling you I'm withholding information from you today. Let's see where we go with this. There's big lessons in here, big lessons. So nice deep breath in, let it go, let your shoulders drop. Ooh, I felt my spine pop. <laughs> nice deep breath in, let it go. Did you notice if that one was a little deeper? Try again. Does that begin to fill you with a sense of groundedness? Anchoring through your feet, sending your roots into Mother Earth with the exhale. Drawing in healing golden energy. Bathing yourself and others in the light. Staying focused on the light. And our reading today comes from Goddess Shift, Women Leading for a Change. And know that I know, I note the irony of that. Stephanie Marone edited this. This isn't never, this is not now. Good morning, Beth. There's more we need to learn. There's more we need to acknowledge. There's more we need to embrace as our world continues to change. As it's been said, change is inevitable. Good morning, Mel. Glad you are here. And our group of practical rebels, I'm going to suggest, the same as the, the re reading I'm going to read for you today, the author is suggesting to the audience that they're speaking to that they're in a unique position. I'm suggesting to us as the practical rebels that we are in a unique position. What will we make of this position that we are in? Breath. Let it go. Just feeling that relaxation message flowing through your body. At the center of life's storms, I stand serene. And why is that? There have been a lot of readings being posted the last couple of days. It's about being centered and grounded in who you are and what you value and that that cannot be taken away from you no matter what stuff looks like, no matter what it looks like. So I'm going to read this chapter to you. And the, this was a commencement speech to students graduating from Harvard University years ago. The reason I'm withholding the speaker's name is because there would be those of you, and I would be one of them, <laughs> who would immediately click into some of the controversy around this person and not hear the message. Here's what I want to say about all of this. It doesn't matter. Good morning, Jan. Glad you are here. Welcome. It doesn't matter who the messenger is. God picks some strange folks for our messengers, doesn't he? Doesn't it? Doesn't the energy of the universe? I'm not into that he thing. Um, that's To me, that's a way that we have created in order to grasp an ungraspable force. Given recent things that are occurring, I want to read this chapter for a reason because it's going to take you within and it's going to get you looking at your own stuff and it's going to help you step up, step up, claim your gifts, use them for good. That's what this chapter is about. So it'll be revealed at the end. Hang with me. The chapter is entitled, 
the fringe benefits of failure and the importance of imagination. So this is a commencement speech and I'm editing here. I'm leaving out some paragraphs, but I'm picking out the stuff that I think makes this point. Actually, I have racked my mind and heart for what I ought to say to you today. I have asked myself what I wish I had known at my own graduation and what important lessons I have learned in the 21 years that have expired between that day and this. I have come up with two answers. On this wonderful day when we are gathered together to celebrate your academic success, I've decided to talk to you about the benefit. Good morning, Doug, glad you're here, welcome. Talk to you about the benefits of failure and as you stand on the threshold of what is sometimes called real life, I want to extol the crucial importance of imagination. These might seem quixotic or paradoxical choices, failure and imagination, but please bear with me. So here's the message. And then she, this person talks about um, her own education. I'm, I'm gonna give it away, it's a woman. Doesn't matter. Again, the messenger doesn't matter. The message and what we choose to take from it is what's important. I would like to make clear that I do not blame my parents for their point of view. They had attempted to talk her out of the career choice or the educational path she took. There is an expiry date on blaming your parents for steering you in the wrong direction. The moment you are old enough to take the wheel, responsibility lies with you. What is more, I cannot criticize my parents for hoping that I would never experience poverty. They had been poor themselves, and I have since been poor, and I quite agree with them that it is not an ennobling experience. Poverty entails fear and stress, and sometimes depression. It means a thousand petty humiliations and hardships. Climbing out of poverty by your own efforts, that is something Indeed, something on which to pride yourself, but poverty itself is romanticized only by fools. What I feared most for myself at your age was not poverty, but failure. I am not dull enough to suppose that because you are young, gifted, and well-educated, that you have never known hardship or heartbreak. Talent and intelligence never yet inoculated anyone against the caprice of the fates. And I do not for a moment suppose that everyone here has enjoyed an existence of unruffled privilege and contentment. However, the fact that you are graduating from Harvard suggests that you are not very well acquainted with failure. You might be driven by a fear of failure quite as much as a desire for success. Indeed, your conception of failure may not be too far from the average person's idea of success. So high have you already flown academically. Ultimately, we all have to decide for ourselves what constitutes failure. But the world is quite eager to give you a set of criteria if you let it. So I think it is fair to say that by any conventional measure, a mere seven years after my graduation day, I had failed on an epic scale. An exceptionally short-lived marriage had imploded, and I was jobless, a lone parent, and poor as it is possible to be without being homeless. The fears my parents had for me and that I had had for myself had both come to pass. And by every usual standard, I was the biggest failure I knew. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that failure is fun. That period of my life was a dark one, and I had no idea that there was going to be what the press has since re represented as a kind of fairy tale resolution. I had no idea how far the tunnel extended, and for a long time, any light at the end of it was a hope rather than a reality. Is that ringing a bell for anybody? How many of you are right now trying to scramble for hope? So why do I talk about the benefits of failure? Simply because failure meant a stripping away of the inessential. I stopped pretending to myself that I was anything other than what I was, and I began to direct all my energy into finishing the only work that mattered to me. So right here is a perfect opportunity for all of us to look at what really matters. What really matters? And what am I willing to do with what really matters? Had I really succeeded at anything else, I might never have found the determination to succeed in the one arena I truly believed I belonged. I was set free 
because my greatest fear had already been realized. And I was still alive, and I still had a daughter I adored, and I had an old typewriter and a big idea. And so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. You may never fail on the scale I did, but some failure in life is inevitable. It is impossible to live without failing at something, unless you live so cautiously that you might as well have not lived at all, in which case you fail by default. Failure gave me an inner security that I had never attained by passing examinations. Failure taught me things about myself that I could have learned no other way. I discovered that I had a strong will and more discipline than I had suspected. I also found that I had friends whose value was truly above rubies. The knowledge that you have emerged wiser and stronger from setbacks means that you are ever after secure in your ability to survive. You will never know yourself or the strength of your relationships until both have been tested by adversity. Many of us feel we're being tested right now. Such knowledge is a true gift for all that it is painfully won, and it has been worth more to me than any qualification I ever earned. Given a time machine or a time turner, I would tell my 21-year-old self that personal happiness lies in knowing that life is not a checklist of acquisition or achievement. Your qualifications, your curriculum vita, vita are not your life, though you will meet many people of my age and older who confuse the two. Life is difficult and complicated and beyond anyone's total control, and the humility to know that will enable you to survive its vicissitudes. Vicissituding away, right? You might think that I chose my second theme, the importance of imagination. Good morning, Cheryl. Welcome. Because of the part it played in rebuilding my life, but that's not holy soul. Though I will defend the value of bedtime stories to my last gasp, I have learned the value imagination to value imagination in a much broader sense. Imagination is not only the uniquely human capacity to envision that which is not yet, <laughs> and therefore the font of all invention and innovation. In its arguably most transformative and revelatory capacity, imagination is the power that enables us to empathize with humans whose experiences we have never shared. So then this person talks about her early time working in Amnesty, Amnesty International. Every day of my working week in my early 20s, I was reminded how incredibly fortunate I was to live in a country with a democratically elected government where legal representation and a public trial were the rights of everyone. Every day I saw more evidence of the evils humankind will inflict on their fellow humans to gain or maintain power. I began to have nightmares, literal nightmares, about some of the things I saw, heard, and read. And yet, good morning, Barb. I also learned more about human kindness at Amnesty International than I had ever known before. Amnesty mobilizes thousands of people who have never been tortured or imprisoned for their beliefs to act on behalf of those who have. The power of human empathy leading to collective action saves lives and frees prisoners. Ordinary people whose personal well-being and security are assured join together in huge numbers to save people they do not know and will never meet. My small participation in that process was one of the most humbling and inspiring experiences of my life. Unlike any other creature on this planet, humans can learn and understand without having experienced. They can think themselves into other people's minds, imagine themselves into other people's places. One might use such an ability to manipulate or control, or just as much to understand and sympathize. Again, it is in our hands to decide how we use that ability. And many prefer not to exercise their imagination at all. They choose to remain comfortably within the bounds of their own experience, never troubling to wonder how it might feel to have been born other than they are. 
They can refuse to hear screams or to peer inside cages. They can close their minds and hearts to any suffering that does not touch them personally. They can refuse to know. I might be tempted to envy people who can live that way, except that I do not think they have fewer nightmares than I do. Choosing to live in narrow spaces can lead to a form of mental agoraphobia, and that brings its own terrors. I think the willfully unimaginative see more monsters. They are often more afraid. Totally fits for what's going on right now. What is more, those who choose not to empathize may enable real monsters. For without ever committing an act of outright evil themselves, we collude with it through our own apathy. One of the many things that I learned at the end of the classics corridor, that was the path she took for education, which I ventured at the age of 18 in search of something I could not yet define, was this, written by the Greek author Plutarch. What we achieve inwardly will change outer reality. If you grab nothing else out of what I'm reading today, please hang on to that. What we achieve inwardly will change outer reality. So the people who are negative about the people who are praying about transformation need to know that that inner work translates externally. It does. We may not see a direct, how do we measure this? But it does. That is an astonishing statement. What we, change, what we achieve in really will change outer reality, and yet proven a thousand times every day in our lives. It expresses in part our inescapable connection with the outside world, the fact that we touch each other's lives simply by existing. But how much more are you, Harvard graduates, likely to touch other people's lives. Your intelligence, your capacity for hard work, the education you have learned and received give you unique status and unique responsibilities. Even your nationality sets you apart. The great majority of you belong to the world's only remaining superpower, which may be becoming not a superpower at this point, and that may be the divine unfolding, and if so, then so. The way you vote, the way you live, the way you protest, the pressure you bring to bear on your government has an impact way beyond your borders. This is your privilege and your burden. If you choose to use your status and influence to raise your voice on behalf of those who have no voice, if you choose to identify not only with the powerful, but with the powerless, if you retain the ability to imagine yourself into the lives of those who do not have your advantages, then it will not only be your proud families who will celebrate your existence, but thousands and millions of people who, whose reality you have helped transform for the better. We do not need magic to change the world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. We have the power to imagine better. Blink, blink. We have the power to imagine better. So over the remainder of our lives, we have the power to imagine better. And what happens when we imagine better? We proceed with doing better. We proceed with making life easier for people who are struggling. We, even in the face of losses, find a way, make a way. So, Things might get more difficult in terms of trying to do the work that I'm doing, building affordable housing. That's likely to be on the chopping block. There's going to be other ways to make things happen. If a door closes, we look for the windows, right? So, what did you take from this this reading. And again, I believe, I totally believe that this work, this these words were channeled through this person. The same way everything that comes out of my mouth each day when I meet you here, all 11 of you at the moment, probably 100 by the end of the day. They're not my words. They're coming through me. They're coming through me. And so I want to go back to that old saw, when we know better, we do better. Amen and hallelujah. So we're doing better. Let's do better incremental betterness, okay? There are those who don't want to hear this message 
because I'm the messenger. There are people who don't want to hear what I just read you because of who the messenger was. And I'll tell you in a moment. Some of you probably already figured it out. But the point is, anybody and everybody, all sentient beings, have a message. Are we paying attention? Are we listening? Are we getting what we need to get from this? Because in order for things to change in the ways that we would like to see, we need to be heeding the messages. We need to be heeding the messages. So the messenger, good morning, Lisa, glad you are here, who brought forth these eloquent words about failure and about imagination was J.K. Rowling. Many of us have a negative reaction to some of the things that she said post the Harry Potter era. Human beings are complicated creatures, right? We, we attempt to box people up. Well, you're a Democrat, so that means you believe this. You're a Republican, so that believes you mean you're a woman, so you must believe this. You're a man, you must believe that. You're you're transgendered, you must believe this. You're rich, you must believe this. You're poor, you must believe this. No, no. Human beings, we can have all manner of combinations. We can have contradictory, seemingly contradictory com combinations, right? We need to allow space for the complexity of the human animal. We need to honor everyone's opportunity to be who they are, to manifest the gifts they've been given. If nothing else, things that happen that we don't like, that we deep down are so disturbed by, that's grist for our mill. That's opportunity. Again, we may not like a messenger at all, but maybe there's something in that message we need to pay attention to. What is it about these words? So here's J.K. Rowling talking about um, imagination and failure. What can we glean from that? What can we glean from whatever's going on that is useful for us bringing our own gifts forward? Maybe, hopefully, in kinder, more loving ways over time. Whatever little piece you can do, do it. Everything counts. I had someone say to me, well, all I really care about is rescuing dogs. You know, and with all the crap going on in the human world, that's probably, no. If rescuing dogs is what speaks to your soul, do that. Be the best you you can be at that. If your thing is um, fostering kids, do that. If you're the person who fills the blessing box at the church with food, do that. Whatever it is you do, you let someone into traffic, you hold a door for someone. Every little act of kindness, every radical little act of kindness matters. It matters. So do that. Do that. So what I would love at the beginning of this speech, this commencement speech, she pointed out that she was very nervous about it and it was a great responsibility. And then she thought back to the commencement speech she listened to. She actually remembered who gave her commencement speech, but she couldn't remember a word of it. And that's the point. That's the issue. Whatever those words were, all of the people sitting there with her took whatever nuggets they were going to take, assimilated it into their system, and moved forward. They couldn't pull any exact words that that person said. You may not be able to pull any exact words that J.K. Rowling just said, but the energy is there within you. The energy is there to stir you to bring your gifts forward. In this time of need, how will you bring your gifts forward? Maybe you make a pie and take it to your next door neighbor. I don't care what it is that you do. Mend the gap. Fill in the divide. Reach across the aisle. Be kind. Be loving. Do not take the bait that gets dangled. Breathe. <sighs> Where's my... Would my unstoppable self do that? The bracelets. What would Jesus do? 
What would Jesus do? How many times, if you're, if you're focusing on the Bible, how many times did Jesus advocate love? A bazillion? <laughs> how many times did he advocate plucking out the eye of your, your enemy, slaying your enemy? But that wasn't his jam at all. Is that stuff all in there? Yeah, it's all in there. But it was a very warlike time then. In America, we continue with a very warlike time. Let us sow peace. Let us sow peace in little ways. As you're driving in your car, all the cars that go past you, whether they've got bumper stickers and flags flying, whatever, especially if they have bumper stickers and flags flying for what you didn't vote for, send good energy, send love, send healing energy, embrace everyone, everyone, even the person that you consider to be the most reprehensible definition of a human being on earth, whoever that is for you, send them love, send them good energy, send them kindness. We can rise above our petty differences. We can rise above whatever fallout there's going to be. We can step into a much higher vibration. I choose that for myself. I hope you choose that for yourself. I bless you on your way. Have an awesome day. Go back and listen a couple of times. See what sinks in. Be the change you want to see in the world. Bye-bye.